Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to today's event on emerging innovations and their potential to transform mitigation and adaptation in agriculture. Um, this is an event in the Resilience Hub under the Food and Agriculture theme. My name is Felicity Tolley. I'm Senior Programme Manager at, uh, for International Energy Access at Energy Saving Trust. Um, and today we've got four, uh, five fantastic speakers uh, showcasing innovations from a variety of sectors. Um, globally, we're already seeing widespread impact of climate change with new and unpredictable weather patterns threatening lives, homes and the resilience of our food systems. This impact is only going to increase as global temperatures increase. Ooh, sorry, flies everywhere. Um, today, uh, we're going to discuss solutions, challenges and opportunities in mitigating and adapting uh, in the agricultural sector. I'm going to quickly introduce our speakers and then we've got uh, four presentations and then we're going to go into our discussion. Uh, on my right, we've got McKenna Ireri, Director of Clean Energy Access at CLASP. Um, we have Ava Kelly Oberender, CEO of REAP, and Sean DeClean um, from the World Economic Forum here as well. And online, we have Richa Goyal from uh, the Energy Saving Trust and Laura Pereira from the University of Witwatersrand and the Stockholm Resilience Centre. I'm going to quickly now hand over to McKenna. Thank you. Um, if you could just put up the slide, slide deck. As you heard, I'm McKenna. I work for CLASS, but we are also part of the Efficiency for Access Coalition that partners with the Resilience Hub. And today I really want to talk about how we can use remote monitoring as a tool to sharpen our ability to deliver technology that then promotes adaptation. So I'm Kenyan, I'm gonna start with the Swahili proverb, kinolewacho hupata, which means that which is sharpened, cut. Uh, and what I'm trying to say here is that we already have the technical solutions that we need, but we need to fine tune those applications so that we can maximize and expedite the impact that we're delivering for people's adaptation and resilience. So it's not just about you know, starting from scratch, it's about sharpening the tools that we've got. And I think remote monitoring could do that. I'm gonna talk about applications in solar water pumping and cold storage. So remote monitoring and sensing is really about data gathering. Uh, so just think about it as either getting real-time data or otherwise that helps you do a lot of things. It can help you predict what might happen in a situation. It can help you um, monitor operations of a technology uh, or customize those operations and also help us to really verify the impact. Um, and beyond those, you can see some of the ways in which each of those pillars um, are supported by remote monitoring. And I'm gonna give examples of a couple of them just to bring it to kind of life um, with what really is the potential for remote monitoring. So let's start with this example. How do you predict the appropriateness of technology? This is from research that we've done on solar water pumping. We use big data, trained it with machine learning to kind of predict the maximum yield that a piece of land could um, you know, potentially, um, uh, so the maximum yield that a piece of land could have. Uh, and also then had farmers with solar water pumps and measured the actual yield that they have on these pieces of land. So in blue there you can see the actual yield and in green is a potential yield. And what this kind of crystallized for us is that sometimes the solar water pump is an absolute right solution for that farmer. So for example, parcel number 52, you can see there's a 2x in yield that is possible if they use a the solar water pump. But for farmer 29, there's not really a significant benefit for, with the addition of a solar water pump. And that modeling helps us to understand where the technology is appropriate and therefore we can apply it, and where it isn't, and therefore we need to think about what other solutions for adaptation are necessary. Um, in another example here, and this is about assuring performance. So having products and technologies that really do work as intended over the lifetime of that product. Here, these are refrigerators, solar refrigerators in Uganda, and we've tested them in the lab to understand how they're going to perform, and then we put them in the field and tested them with users to see if there's a difference in the performance. And you can see how wide that difference is. So the green, you know, green and yellow hard to see, but the green is the lab, the yellow is the field, and sometimes the energy consumption difference is 
really significant. And because they are solar based, that really translates to additional panels, additional costs. And if you can't afford those panels, it translates to a downtime in your refrigerator. So if you really wanted to, for example, keep fish or something that's really, really perishable, this is a direct loss for the user of that product. And whatever cooling adaptation potential they had gets lost because we didn't um, kind of assure the performance of that product. If you do this continuously and in real time, you can predict maintenance. You can know when the product is about to fail. You can monitor batteries uh, and really understand and pre-warn users of um, the potential for a downtime. And that would really save a lot and increase um, the ability to kind of maintain uh, whatever technology that they have. And then finally, how do we use remote monitoring, for example, to verify impact? This is going back to the solar water pump modeling um, example that I was talking about before. And here we are tracking the green vegetative index, basically how green a plot of land is using satellite imaging. And you can see on the left-hand side, again, I really need to use better contrasting colors so that it's really clear. But uh, the first chart there is in 2019, we observed folks who had a solar water pump, and then also reference plots that were very similar to the same, you know, the, the farmers were very similar, but they didn't have solar water pumps. And so in 2019, you can see that their productivity, which is the y-axis, is really distributed. Everyone with a solar water pump is somewhere in there together with their cohort, and it's very similar. But by 2020, they've just kind of risen to the top in terms of their productivity. That's the treatment group, the ones with the solar water pumps. And in this way, we can really be able to show that the, the impact is accruing, and it can be observed over time. Uh, and remote monitoring, again, really essential for that. So I guess in closing, and I only have five minutes, um, Really, we, it's all about sharpening what we've got. We have the technology. It's there. It works. But how do we make it work better to make it, um, to increase the impact and to do that in an expedited way, given the urgency that we have? Remote monitoring can help us deploy the right technology, put it in the right context, and get the information to design the right size of so the solution for the right um, person or farmer or whoever we want to build resilience for. It can then help us make sure that that technology is, continues to work over its lifetime and deliver those impacts and then help us to understand and measure the impacts that we're getting from the technology. Um, so I think this is a great innovation and, and one that should really be considered to attach to any technology to deliver adaptation. Uh, and with that, I'll yeah, hand over to the next person. Thank you. Thank you, McKenna. Um, really, really useful to, to understand um, how to most effectively deploy the technologies that we, we already have, which are enabling uh, increased food security. Um, I'm now going to, oh, before I, before I move on to the next speaker, I'd like to say that we'll take questions at the end. Um, if you're joining us online, please enter your questions virtually, and I'm gonna keep an eye on my phone for them coming to me via WhatsApp. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Richa Goyal from my team at Energy Saving Trust and the Efficiency for Access Coalition. Thanks, Felicity, and hi, everyone, to the panel over there. Um, so uh, I work for Energy Saving Trust and also co-lead the research um, work stream at Efficiency for Access Coalition. So uh, to start off, uh, are we panning my slides? I can't see them yet. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. so, thank you. So um, to start off, so I may have been too ambitious uh, for the five minutes I've been allotted uh, in terms of the number of slides. So I'll try and stop somewhere midway, but I'll try and cover all the points I wanted to make. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of agenda, so solar technologies themselves can have a direct impact on user resiliency. Uh, for example, remote monitoring technologies, as McKenna was explaining, communication technologies, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to enabling agricultural solar technologies to farmers, the type of agricultural system a farmer is embedded in has a big role in influencing farmer resiliency and adaptive capacity. And by virtue of that, the resiliency of the solar product user itself. So one of these farming systems, uh, which is being increasingly looked at as a significant climate change mitigation tool, alongside boosting farmer resiliency and agricultural yields is regenerative agriculture. 
So in, in, um, in one of my first few slides, I'll talk a little bit about the synergies we found in enabling solar technologies to farmers embedded in regenerative agricultural systems. And then given time, I will take maybe one example from the work by um, Agra and Cereal Growers Association in Kenya in maize value chain, where they capacity built farmers to undertake regenerative agricultural practices to illustrate some of the key differences in embedding solar technologies in a conventional agricultural system versus embedding them in a regenerative agricultural system. Next slide, please. So let's look at the synergies first. So convention, number one, conventional agriculture is at odds with several other sustainable development goals. Uh, for example, good health and well-being, which is SDG 3. Uh, there are two main ways in which conventional agriculture is, is counterintuitive to this goal. One is lack of dietary diversity is a key reason for chronic, mal, uh, chronic nutritional deficiency. Um, uh, and we know that world's 64% calories come from four main crops, which are wheat, maize, rice and soy, and none of them are indigenous to Africa. And conventional agricultural systems encourages production of these high calorie monocropping grains at the expense of production of indivi indigenous and diverse crops. The second is that there is a lot of scientific evidence that suggests that produce from regenerative agricultural systems is nutritionally superior than that of conventional systems. Just to give an example, produce from organically managed soils possesses higher levels of bioactive phytochemicals than conventionally managed soils and foods. Now let's look at clean water and sanitation, which is SDG 6. Chemical runoff from applied fertilizers, pesticides and insecticides contaminates water supplies and ends up in human bodies and aquatic life. Climate action, SDG 13. So global agriculture accounts for a quarter of the global emissions, including fallow, etc. And global agriculture is conventional agriculture dominant, whereas regenerative agriculture is actually carbon negative. And so when we enable access to solar technologies to farmers undertaking regenerative agriculture, we are already catering to a healthier and more resilient system. Uh, furthermore, regenerative agriculture can de-risk solar payments. So two risk areas where, where farmers have a little bit, uh, farmers undertaking regenerative agriculture practices are a little bit more cushioned than conventional farmers are crop yields and pest attacks. So if farmers are more resilient in these areas, it can also potentially de-risk solar payments. Uh, for example, 75% of global soils are degraded. You must have heard this in other panels at the COP. And among the other reasons, one of the key reasons for this is depletion of soils from conventional agriculture. And regenerative agriculture can increase yields over conventional agriculture and reduce cost of inputs as well. And this is especially true now in the wake of Ukraine-Russia war because a lot of synthetic fertilizers were being imported into Africa from that region. And because of these price hikes and supply restrictions, uh, you know, in the economics of manure and compost production has improved. Um, also, regenerative ag agriculture can offer high resiliency in the face of so shocks such as pest attacks. So, for example, fall armyworm, which is the major pest in, in maize, um, the key crop in, in Kenya, you know, infests much faster in prolonged drought periods, which is a direct climate change link. Then solarized productive use technology results in significant time use savings. Finally, climate finance, carbon sequestration opportunities uh, from regenerative agriculture farms can be combined with greenhouse gas mitigation benefits from using solarized technologies. Just to give you an example, so Project Drawdown, uh, you know, says that regenerative agriculture uh, can potentially solve 10% of global climate change, which would bring it at par with solar or wind energy. So it is an important mix in the basket. And Vera has already published a methodology that can combine offsetting from regenerative agriculture and solar technologies in a single carbon credit. Finally, regenerative agriculture and the humanitarian nexus. We know that in Africa, especially in East Africa, tens and thousands of hectares of farmlands have become so degraded that they can no longer produce adequate or regular crop or pasture for livestock. And due to climate change and prolonged drought cycles and flooding events, more and more farmers are going to be displaced, which are going to overwhelm, already overwhelm humanitarian settings. Um, so this was a little bit about the synergies. Finally, I'll just give one example of you know, how um, embedding solar technologies in, in um, regenerative context can be a little bit different, citing the example of solar water pump. Could we go two slides forward, please? Yeah, thank you. So in a regenerative agricultural setting, it would be important to undertake water harvesting practices alongside solar 
water pump interventions as water harvesting strategies can help reduce the demand for artificial irrigation. For example, I mentioned the Agra CGA work with maize farmers in Kenya. And one of the key interventions they undertook was to plant maize crops with cover, cover crops or nitrogen fixing legumes in zai pits. Zai pits are pits that are dug and therefore prevent moisture loss. And whenever rain falls within them, it keeps water in and cover crops prevent further moisture loss. Um, and so there is an indirect link between building, uh, you know, farmer resiliency with regenerative agricultural practices and a farmer's credit worthiness for solar payments. Um, in addition to solar appliances impacting farmers positively, a resilient cohort of farmers are the ones who will be able to support a solar appliance market built on market-based principles in the first place. And so when finally, just in conclusion, so, you know, when policymakers consider enabling access to pumps for irrigation, it is also important to take a long-term view on whether water access will be available to a farmer in the face of prolonged drought periods. Um, and this will, need into take to, this will need to take into account longevity of the water storage solutions as well, whether it is tanks, ponds, or other solutions. And one of the things that energy access stakeholders can consider is piloting a, a bundled service of financing plan for a solar water pump alongside storage solutions like a tank or a pond, as well as water harvesting strategies. Uh, I'll stop there and take any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Richa. Very, um, very helpful to see the, the role of technology in regenerative agriculture in mitigating against uh, uh, the impacts of climate change. Um, we'll take questions after all of our other speakers, if that's okay. Um, next, over to Eva. Thank you and good morning. Uh, first of all, thank you for our partners for putting this event together. We know how much effort this is to make it happen. So thank you so much for, to everyone for making the effort. And thank you all for joining us this morning. It's a Saturday morning. We're all getting a bit tired, but uh, we appreciate uh, your coming to join us for this discussion. Um, a little bit of a background on REAP. Uh, REAP designs and implements um, innovative mechanisms to create market for clean energy. Our partners are small and medium enterprises that deliver clean energy technologies and services uh, including alongside the agricultural value chains. And we also work primarily in uh, the off-grid sector. So this is just to frame as to how we come into the conversation. Uh, we do a number of things. We support small and medium enterprises. We work with governments, but we also work with local financial institutions to create a well-functioning local financial system. And this is what I would like to talk about today as an example of an innovative financing mechanism that we have put in place in the country of Nepal. Um, we have chosen Nepal for a number of reasons. Number one, Nepal is one of the countries with the highest vulnerability to effects of climate change. Nepal is also transitioning in 2026 from least developed country. Uh, congratulations to them, but uh, by doing so, we expect that the foreign aid flowing to Nepal is going to be lower than, than it's been so far. And therefore, we, uh, Nepal has got a bigger requirement to look at more market-based solutions to continue uh, the growth of renewable energy um, and other alternative energy sources for, for the low-carbon future. Nepal has got quite progressive policies. For example, they're going to be putting 15,000 megawatts of generation capacity from clean energy sources in the next decade. And they also mandated uh, the local commercial banks to have at least 10% in their portfolio in the clean energy sector by 2025. And not, last but not least, there are some fantastic partners in the country. Um, NMB Bank is one of the leading uh, banks in Asia in low carbon development and low carbon lending. They were uh, voted the best bank in Asia in 2021. And we also work with SNV on technical capacity in the country. Um, the facility really aims to deploy um, innovative blending uh, finance to support renewable energy projects alongside the agricultural value chain and achieve environmental and social benefits along the way. Mm -hmm. 
And by doing so, what really we're trying to achieve is to shift from grant and subsidy funding to more commercial funding that flows into clean energy projects along the agri-food value chains. Um, and there are, of course, some other benefits like <laughs> climate and energy poverty and poverty reduction overall. This is a first loss, first loss guarantee facility uh, that sits in Nepal. It's done in partnership with the Austrian government that has provided the funding to do this. REAP has uh, structured the facility and provided uh, an NMB Bank with an operating manual. And we have transferred the funding over to NMB Bank at sitting there at their disposal for the uh, eventuality that it would be needed. The credit uh, facility um, fun uh, functions as a portfolio facility and we've got a committee that chooses the appropriate projects under this facility. The facility is in operation and has issued a number of loans um, to small and medium enterprises along the agri-food value chain and we cover the first loss um, if in the case of defaults in the level of 25%. Just a summary of um, what we're doing overall. Number one, developing the credit guarantee facility, mainstream commercial lending. We're working with the um, Alternative Energy Promotion Center in Nepal, which is a well-established local agency in promoting uh, clean energy technologies and services on building their capacity and operational guidelines and other tools. And as I mentioned, we are also having some co-benefits around the environmental and social uh, elements. In summary, we've created an innovative financial instrument that is uh, catalyzing further investment into clean energy along the agri-food value chains. We are reducing energy poverty, we are, we, are, we are reducing poverty overall, we are reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but we are also able to mobilize additional credit lines from other sources. And we've got impacts on international impact finance that's flowing into the country. And we have the possibility to replicate in other provinces in Nepal and in other countries in the region. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, always the question, um, how can we more effectively finance this transition? So thank you very much for that. Um, our last presentation today comes from Laura. If we could pull that up and I'll do your slides for you, Laura. It's just me, no slides. Oh, sorry, yes, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, great to be with you all. And uh, yeah, sad that I'm not I'm still sitting there in the hub with you, but it's amazing that we can join them um, re remotely. And um, yeah, so, so instead of sort of presenting slides and, uh, and numbers and figures, I guess I'm going to tell a little bit more of a story of some examples of, um, of hope that I've seen around um, food and agricultural um, initiatives within the South African context, but I think that are also um, applicable um, across the continent um, in terms of scaling impact, not necessarily sort of scaling up. Um, and so this is this is more about not necessarily social cooperatives, but definitely about cooperation um, and a lot about how um, the power of building networks um, can actually be used um, against sort of dominant uh, narratives or discourses that we see within the um, the food system. I think um, the previous speakers have really set up the context well, and, and in particular, Richard talking about you know, the problems of conventional agriculture and how we need to come up with alternatives that are applicable within specific contexts. Um, and she also set up beautifully uh, the, the reference to why aren't we using our indigenous and local crop varieties? Um, why, why are we eating food that is sort of largely this kind of almost global diet um, when there's, there's such richness uh, that that can come from different places and different contexts? Um, and, and sort of regenerative agriculture is an interesting um, component of that that really is pushing pushing back against the um, conventional agriculture um, narrative and discourse that we're seeing. Um, I do a lot of work uh, with, with agroecological practices, but I actually want to take it further down the agricultural sort of value chain and not just thinking about the production end, which is super important that we need to get right, but but where is the, the market actually for these products? What is it that we actually land up eating? And there is an interesting example in the Western Cape 
of South Africa, um, where we have the Feinbos um, biome, which is sort of extremely protected, um, high levels of biodiversity, um, but is also um, sort of the part of the world where um, humans actually kind of um, evolved into the societies that we see today, right? That there was such a richness of that coastal ecosystem um, being able to, to forage from the, the, the local environment, but also having access to, um, to, to, to uh, important sort of coastal foods, uh, that there's a lot of evidence from the um, archaeological record that that's actually sort of what was feeding um, the, the, the increase in our brain. And so this is an, an, a really important um, area where we can start thinking about food practices, but that was ex sort of largely eroded um, uh, during, um, during colonialism. So we, we've lost a lot of the knowledge that was associated with this environment, with this ecosystem um, that was actually so important for, um, for the evolution of humans. Um, and so how can we get that back? Uh, sort of, uh, Rich was also mentioning Zypits, you know, the, the use of local, um, well, indigenous and local knowledge. Um, how can we think of that as an important innovation um, that we also need to um, bring into our, um, our, our, our strategies for improving um, food, food and livelihoods um, for, for people across the world? And so a, um, an NGO was, was set up after a variety of um, sort of discussions that, that had happened between researchers, between practitioners um, within the Western Cape uh, food system called Local Wild. And this was really just to try and reinvigorate the use of um, local and indigenous foods within the Western Cape. And it's a really interesting example because um, it actually started a lot from the, um, from the consumption side. Uh, so Cape Town is a really uh, big tourist destination, uh, kind of seen as the food capital of South Africa. Uh, and so chefs were actually experimenting with uh, what is, how can we bring some of the local into our, um, uh, onto our plates in essence. Um, and so this had really sparked an, an important discussion around, okay, so there, there, there is some way that we can start to put these, um, these plants and these foods back on our plates. Um, but we also don't want to see the kind of capture of this only being accessible to elites, people who can afford it, people who are going to sort of high-end chefs. But um, the use of chefs and their knowledge in these systems was able to kind of drive a shift away from, oh, if you're foraging, locally from the environment. This is kind of seen as almost a, almost a famine food strategy, right? This is only what the poorest people do, but if you start to have income, that's when you can, can access the, the, the fast foods, the, the KFCs, et cetera. Um, but actually seeing that this as well, it's, it's, uh, it's actually um, something that could be aspirational because it's, it's landing up on the plates um, of, uh, of, of, of these high-end restaurants. So how can we make sure that that, that that mechanism also allows access to people who, whose knowledge is deeply connected and embedded in these places, um, that it's not sort of just driving a, another sort of power grab of, of the elites being able to capture that. And so this is where network formation became really important uh, and a really important conscientization of um, whose knowledge do, needs to be recognized um, and so who actually needs to be uh, at the table, literally and figuratively when it comes to these kinds of, um, of interventions. And also sitting within um, sort of biodiversity conservation awareness, um, how can we start to actually cultivate some of these important foods uh, and not just rely on foraging from, from landscape? And so over the past couple of years, you've seen a really interesting network of farmers who are wanting to um, experiment to grow with some of these foods, knowing that there is an important market for them, that there are people with the knowledge for how to actually use these foods um, innovatively on a plate. Um, and also coming up with mechanisms to make sure that that access isn't only limited to those who can afford it. So coming up with um, sort of financing co-payment mechanisms, for example, where you charge higher premiums to, to restaurants, but you're still able to keep some um, percentages of these foods within um, within the local environment. It's also extended not just from terrestrial, um, but also thinking through um, through access for, for fisheries. So actually thinking more about a coastal food system, not just about a terrestrial food system. Um, and um, snook, for example, is, is a very important fish with, um, with, uh, with for local people um, and making sure that they're able to both get um, profits from, from fishing, that they can um, sort of take these two 
uh, to, to the restaurants that are wanting them, where chefs are able to actually deal with whatever catch happens to come in. They're not sort of locked into a particular um, sort of uh, set of, of, of fish that they need to bring in. But at the same time, that we can also keep some of those um, some of those fish in the local communities. And, and these, these networks are starting to grow. Um, and it's really about sort of getting rid of some of the middleman um, and actually building trust between um, the producers or the, or the fishers, the foragers and consumers and recognizing local knowledge. And it's, there's still a long way to go. Uh, I think there are a lot of tensions, particularly with um, some of the indigenous uh, Khoisan communities around how this knowledge is being used uh, and where that recognition actually lies. But I think that you know, the ability to have open and honest conversations and the platforms around this is a really good example of how we can reinvigorate um, indigenous local knowledge systems around foods, around improved nutrition, and then the role of research and science in being able to help form these, these networks and these platforms, and also around some of the analyses, for example, around the nutritional benefits um, of these foods. You know, we still need that evidence to be able to make sure that we are, um, that we are actually um, in improving um, diets uh, and access within the region. But that's just a, a small story from the Western Cape um, on what, what we've seen around cooperation networks and this focus on improving um, diversity and particularly focusing on, um, on leveraging indigenous and local knowledge and, and recognizing it uh, as for, for its innovation potential. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lara. It always... It always feels strange to talk about um, harnessing local indigenous knowledge is, is innovative, but when conventional farming and the impacts of colonialism are so entrenched, breaking through that can take a lot of, of um, it requires innovative thinking sometimes. Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers, uh, our presentations. Um, I'm gonna pass to Sean now um, to provide us with a bit of, of a way to some thoughts around wrapping all of this together and the interconnections between these sectors. Thank you. And um, no, I mean, it's exciting being here. I must say this is like, this is Saturday, uh, but it's actually the first food day that COP has had. And so that in itself is a, a huge uh, sort of achievement that we're actually breaching the food agenda and the more traditional COP uh, agenda. So very exciting in that sense to be actually having this conversation around the crossover between energy and food, you know, during during the first day. There's actually like five food pavilions. It's gone from none to having five uh, uh, at COP. So the, you know, the, the reality of what we're talking about is, is happening real time. I think just listening to the to, to the panel today, it, it was there, there was a lovely flow in a way, and, and I've got just three simple observations. One is just around the word systems. I mean, it's exciting to see that we're using food systems and and energy systems and taking that systems view. We are going to we, we're looking at the way that food looks at you know, how do we make food more nutritious, how do we build in regenerative agriculture, take a, you know, a, a net zero nature positive, more resilient food, more inclusive food systems, but we're also looking at how systems interact with each other and so how the energy system interacts with the food system because we've got to break through the silos and that's what we're hearing today. I've been at so many conversations over the years where the energy conversation's happening over here and then the food conversations happening over here, and you never actually bring these these two together, uh, or the climate conversations happening over here, and the nutrition conversations happening over here, and and they never meet. So so that the the fact that these the systems thinking is coming to the fore in a much more dynamic way, is is both challenging. It's very complex, but it's also very exciting about the opportunity that it. To, that allows us to take a more holistic view. I think the second observation I would make is just around this This does, um, you know, the, the last speaker was talking about networks to really bring this alive. It's how do we move beyond the traditional thinking of partnerships to much more dynamic network platform thinking? Because if we just stay at the level of small individual partnerships, brilliant though they often are as a proof of concept, we will not get to scale. And if we're going to really break through from proof of concept, proof of impact to 
impact at scale, we're going to have to we're going to have to think in a different way as to how do we do that. If we're going to move from training several thousand farmers in conservation type agriculture, in regenerative agriculture, in agroecology type practices, for example, to shifting to training millions of farmers in a very short space to adopt those kinds of practices, the traditional go out and work with those individuals, farmers on a small group by small group basis, it's just, we just don't have the time to, to do that. So we're gonna have to rethink the kinds of network building and, uh, and uh, platform generations. And that really brings me to my third point, which came through so powerfully today, which that's gonna require a real rethink around innovation. We're, we're gonna have to get a lot more innovative in the sorts of policy mechanisms that incentivize this kind of uh, shift. We're gonna to have to get a lot more innovative, as I said, in the partnership models. We're gonna to have to get a lot more innovative in the way that we use innovation, the way that we use data. You know, the, the you know, McKenna's first presentation there about really smart use of data to zero in on where we can actually achieve impact rather than actually doing a scattergun approach and hoping that one of those things work. And so, you know, much more smart systems thinking. We're going to have to get a lot more innovative in the way we bring people in, the way we use indigenous knowledge uh, and local knowledge to, to do that. So it's going to require, and, and then finally, I think the finance piece, we're going to have to get very, very innovative in terms of how we actually look at blended finance, how we de-risk some of these transitions. Because at the end of the day, if this is not profitable for you as a smallholder farmer, and it really comes down to, and that's why food and food, Food systems are interesting because people are right at the heart of it. We eat food, you know, we engage with food every day. It's very personal to us and to, to our culture and to our history. Um, but it also involves hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers who are growing that food every day. And so we have to, this, this actually requires, you know, the farmer is not going to take a risk on something necessarily if they're not going to see a profitable return and they're actually going to take a loss for four years when at the same time the impact of climate change is, is real and they're being hit by this on a daily basis. And so how do we bridge that transition gap? And that's going to require some really innovative thinking around the financing models to de-risk and create that transition bridge. So I'll leave it there, but those three big things are real... You know, it's really exciting to see systems thinking coming in, really thinking about how do we achieve impact at scale, the sort of networks, platform building, uh, you know, platforms of partnerships coming together with a common objective, and then real dynamic surge in the way that we think about innovation and innovation work. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, really, really clear messages. You've, you've helped us... Um, well, our aim for this, at the end of this session is to list out three enabling factors and, and three challenges in, in reaching scale with these innovations. And you've really given us a head start on that. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, we're going to open to, to questions um, in a second. But I'm going to kick us off by asking um, McKenna, could you tell us a bit about the market maturity of the appliances you mentioned? I mean, you mentioned solar water pumps, but there are other, other relevant appliances as well. Yeah, I, I mean, in, I'm going to speak for Sub-Saharan Africa, which is what I know most about. Um, the maturity of um, some of these appliances that help build adaptation and resilience is varying, right? Uh, and we use this term productive use appliance for them. Um, and, and, but the most promising do seem to be solar water pumps. It seems to be that's where there's the most need. It seems to be that's where there's most potential. And also the technology is there and has been there since the 1970s. So, you know, it, it seems obvious, but yet it hasn't scaled. So, so then there's that question about why hasn't it scaled. Um, the next best thing that we're seeing coming up to the surface is cooling. Cooling for agriculture, maybe cold chains, but those have to be really well thought out and not necessarily just isolate technologies where we haven't connected the entire cold chain for the particular value chain. So if it's mangoes, we need to connect that cold chain from the beginning to the end. Instead of um, sometimes we're investing in technologies that we leave stranded in people's farms without connecting them up and that makes no you know, it, it really doesn't add 
to, to the potential that we're trying to build here. And it goes to that systems conversation, right? If that whole system doesn't work together, then, then we're not doing, not doing well, really. So I think those two are the most promising. And e-vehicles seem to be the new shiny thing, actually, in terms of connecting farmers to market, in terms of moving goods and, transport, and transporting people and goods. I think those are really interesting. Um, so I'd say those three seem to be the ones that are rising to the top, but there's also contextual technologies that can really support specific value chains in specific contexts that also need to be thought about. We, the, our panelists um, online are talking about really being locally led. Um, so we shouldn't forget about the technologies that maybe our niche maybe will not get to the kind of scale that we sometimes want to think about, right? But are still useful. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, can we please bring up our two online panelists on the screen? That would be great. Thank you. Um, following up on, on that, I mean, the other challenge in access to these technologies is affordability. It's a major barrier. Um, and Ava, you talked a bit about, um, about uh, funding. Um, how can we truly leave no one behind in trying to, in trying to scale this impact? And, and thank you for bringing the issue of affordability um, on the table because it is um, really at the heart of the issue because the technologies are here. We've got really good examples of how they can support the energy food systems. Um, the issue is affordability. The issue is understanding how these technologies work. And, uh, and then at the other side, on the SME side, it's very often... Um, issues with access to appropriate financing at the time that they require it, which is very difficult without the local financial system. And then also the types of financing that are available, including uh, working capital. Working capital financing is so difficult to secure. And without that, it's really, really difficult for the small and medium enterprises to be able to uh, go on the growth path. I'm looking at our colleague Marianne, who is a private sector representative here in the room, and uh, she would probably be able to talk to us a lot more about this. But for example, Simo Solar has had to go into financing the end consumer um, side of, of this equation because there was just no, no one else in the market um, servicing the mar farmers. And this is one of the issues that we are facing, is that we've got fantastic uh, small and medium enterprises that understand what they need to do, that understand how to access the market, and understand how to um, build the technologies appropriately to the um, settings that they are in. But at the same time, um, consumer financing is, is a massive issue. Thanks. Thank you very much, yes. Um, Happy to come to you, Marianne, later on if you have any input that you'd like to add. Um, slightly tangential question for Richa here. Um, how important is technical innovation to the, su the success of regenerative agriculture? Which one takes precedence, or is it? do they both have to work together? Uh, yeah, so uh, this technical innovation is certainly necessary uh, the innovation piece is also very important in the business models and uh, first of all doing a needs assessment of what kind of technologies might be suitable to regenerative agricultural value chains. Uh, just to give you an example that in some contexts some specialized equipment might be needed uh, which you know in, in conventional agricultural value chains might completely miss us. For example I gave the example of zy pits in, in maize value chain. And digging those zy pits can be very labor intensive. Uh, so from the data that we collected on the field, um, it can take four, wa four farmers working on average for three days a week for, for four months to dig zy pits for one acre of farmland, right? So that's a huge amount of labor. So, you know, having, having kind, some kind of a tractor implement, for example, for digging or, or some kind of a pneumatic machine, which is quite simple. Uh, but, but, you know, just making it available in an accessible way at an affordable price point. Um, so a needs assessment has to be done um, in speaking with regenerative agricultural specialists, 
बिकॉज दोज आर द गायज हु विल नो वॉट मशीनरी एंड इक्विपमेंट यू नीड यू नो सो इट्स नॉट अ प्रॉब्लम दैट एनर्जी एक्सेस टेक होल्डर्स कैन सॉल्व अलोन यू हैव टू वर्क इन एन एक्सट्रीमली इंटर डिसिप्लिनरी मैनर दैट्स वन बट you uh, the second aspect is that it will also be uh, you know in in regenerative agricultural context the sizing of different appliances might be a little bit different uh, because um, uh, the the soils are healthier they have larger water retention capacity for instance so it could be that even less amount of artificial irrigation is needed and therefore the pump sizing may need to be reduced but of course we need to do more studies to really study this and and get some evidence but it can have impact on farmer affordability aspects as well because you may not need a larger sized pump for example um, at the same time several business models and several um, agricultural processing processing equipment for instance might just be same as as conventional agriculture uh both both types of value chains will need some there will be some similarities as well thank you richa yeah we definitely need to make sure that using these these technologies doesn't exacerbate the the impacts of of climate change and make resources even more scarce than they are at the moment um follow up question for laura here um richa talked about kind of uh farmers working together on these these challenges um how um can we build lasting relationships with social leaders that catalyze the formation of empowered and effective social cooperatives which um can help to to um bridge this affordability barrier when people work together sure i mean i think that this i mean it, it's really important um but it really starts with trust and i think that there's been so much distrust that has been built up in the food system um over the past 30 40 years i guess sort of as we've seen this really big takeover of um conventional agriculture industrialization um i think um most people are familiar with kind of the hourglass figure of you know many many farmers tiny little sets of sort of corporate um actors that kind of control most of what's happening in the global food system and then all of us as consumers um and and that just leads to a lot of distrust um you see it even with um with government actors within the south african food system and um, that they kind of seem to be selling out to a lot of um corporate uh, industry interests rather than actually um looking at the needs of of these much more local context specific um innovations and and networks that are being formed so i think trust is at the center and also just recognizing and understanding that power dynamics are there and that you can't ignore them right and um, so we do a lot of work um within the seeds of good anthropocenes project but also in in some other work that we've been doing around um this idea of transformation labs where we sort of bring a diversity of people together to look at how we could um action uh impact around a complex or wicked problem um but you know who you have in the room is really important so if you think about power dynamics you know you definitely you, you may need industry you may need government but you might not need them to take up 50% of the seats around the table you actually want to look at the power dynamics and see that there's a much larger presence from people who are normally marginalized or under underrepresented and i think you know those kinds of mechanisms you can start to um take into the to the fore as you're looking at building these these networks um look, looking at trust um I think also just recognizing how innovative people can actually be right so we talk about the affordability of the technology which is which is critical and super important um but at the same time I think because of uh it's a it's an interesting term that was coined by a bunch of um sort of development innovation uh, economists around scarcity led innovation um and not in any way saying that you know conditions of scarcity are something that that we should be looking at but so much innovation that comes out of people who are really operating on the margins um needs to be recognized and seen for for the innovation that it really is um and i think that emphasizing um and sort of as has been mentioned looking at how we could finance those much more local solutions um i think is something really critical uh because because it, it they become sort of by definition affordable because they're coming from a place where where we aren't reliant on sort of um importing technology transfers from elsewhere so so i think from the financing perspective i'm looking at um and not necessarily just scaling up and having the same technology operating in multiple different places but actually i'm looking at 
what is it that we, how, what are the mechanisms for scaling impact that are really important? And I think here yeah, that it's much more about building, sort of scaling deep, uh, building these relationships between people, building trust, building connections, where it's been largely lost within the food system is what we really need to be focusing on if we're actually going to see the kinds of transformative changes that we know we need to have um, in our food system if we're going to be meeting the SDGs, if we're going to be staying within a 1.5 degree target, but if we're also going to be sort of building um, sustainable and equitable livelihoods for, for everyone. And I probably talked a lot around your question, but hopefully it was still useful, Felicity. Thank you, Lara. Um, no, that was fantastic. Um, and a, a real reminder of the importance of knowing um, knowing what people actually need, um, which the data points come into as well. Um, at Efficiency for Access, we do lots of work on inclusivity, and we certainly recognize that there's a gap in understanding who is using the appliances that are available in the market, but also who could be using them, and how could we make them um, more accessible for, for the different audiences. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. I'd like to open up to questions from the audience, if there are any in the room. We've got one over here. Uh, do we have a microphone for the room? No. Okay, I'll bring it to you. Thank you. Um, I'm Katrin Harvey from the Ban Ki-moon Center. Um, first of all, congratulations to a very gender-inclusive panel. And that is also uh, the question I'm going for is how, because we've been talking about smallholder farmers, and especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, women are producing a lot of the food that is needed. Um, how do you ensure that, especially when it comes to financing, um, women are included? Uh, how can we make sure that uh, access to finance is guaranteed to women as well? So that's my question. Thank you very much. I'll pass this one to Ava, I think. Yeah, obviously very tricky situation and very tricky um, challenge to uh, overcome. That being said, there are cultural differences in various countries uh, across the sub-Saharan African continent. So there are uh, cultures where, you know, women are quite dominating in the um, cultural settings and are able to access um, credit lines, etc., from microfinance institutions and are able to um, be owners of the land and are able to be whole, um, owners of the equipment. And um, on the other side of, of where this is less likely to do so, there's a lot of work to be done on awareness raising, working with the partnerships and the platforms to make sure that you know, inclusive uh, development is, is achieved. There's a lot of um, specialized outfits around the world that specialize on um, gender inclusivity in um, training in uh, business advisory around uh, gen women-led businesses, etc., etc. So a lot of concerted efforts and a lot of um, um, efforts also on the side of the investors. So we do a lot of uh, gender lens investing and doing a lot of work with the uh, local financial institutions on uh, awareness raising and uh, capacity building around women-led businesses. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question in the room. Hi there. Uh, my name is Guðbjörg. I'm from a company named Atmonia in Iceland. I have a very simple question. Um, I have a technology that I think might benefit smallholder farmers, and uh, especially in South Southern Africa and small island countries. How do I get it there? Excellent question. McKenna, have you got any thoughts? It depends on what the technology is. <laughs> I think you would start by understanding the need, right? Um, so I'm assuming you've done this, right? Going um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, finding out the need and the demand for such a technology and what solution it's trying to solve for. I think that's the first, first part. And then if there is a need and there is um, you know, uh, a real case for that technology in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, then I think your first point of view is to work with a partner based in Sub-Saharan Africa because to, to, to get things done, I think it's important to start with the people on the ground and the people who are already there doing something 
similar or maybe complementary, work with them to figure out where to try it. And there's a lot of funding available to, for early stage piloting um, programs from EEP. I think also REAP used to do early stage financing for, for trying um, new technologies on the ground. And then access that and try it. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy to share business cards to make these connections about which organizations to partner with and then also how to, how to um, pilot once you, get, once you get that. Thank you. I'd, um, I'd like to add that um, there's a wealth of information out there about what markets are, are more developed than others for different technologies, um, where the gaps are. I mean, obviously, lots of unknown unknowns as well. Um, but it would certainly, um, I'd put a plug for efficiency for access. There's a lot of information on our website for that kind of um, market impact statements, etc. cetera. Um, any other questions in the room for anyone? One at the back. Thank you. Um, Arabo Bala, the director of SEED, Entrepreneurship for Sustainable Development. I'm an ex-UN staff for many years. From the summary that was done on the system analysis, I don't disagree. I mean, I fully agree with that. I'm a systemist myself. And I'm happy to see how much we talk about systems today, but the danger that it is becoming just a word that everybody is using, but we don't know how to work in a system approach. We should keep this in mind. Exactly as we started with sustainability, we don't know what it is. But this being said, the work connecting agriculture and energy in a system approach is absolutely necessary, and we need to enlarge it. But I want to come here to some comments that were made first. I think it was Laura or Laura, when she mentioned that innovation should be deeply rooted. Most of the time, the finance that is accessible is with different type of innovation, not the one that is deeply rooted by farmers and local entrepreneurs, which is extremely difficult to handle. So if we want to build resilience, we need to have deeply rooted innovation from the local people. Now, I have two, a simple question. To Laura, how much around you those local innovative, innovative people have access to finance, which sometimes is just $5,000, $10,000. And to Eva, in your approach, how much do you give attention to the social and environmental parameters and do these type of small innovators part of your network or clients? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, over to you, Lara. So, I mean, I think that's the nail on the head, right? Um, I would say very little. Um, there's not a lot of financing that goes into these kinds of, of initiatives. Um, and I think that it's, um, it's, it's largely around potentially perceived risk um, of, of, of investment. You're not going to see the kinds of returns on investment. We're not talking sort of like massive scale in terms of like as an investor, I'm going to see all of these, these massive returns from these kinds of deeply rooted local technologies. But the returns are gonna be in, in the, the social and environmental and other um, sort of benefits that arise. Um, so I think, I think that there is a lot that needs to be done around um, diversifying the kinds of finance mechanisms that can really enable what needs to be done on the ground to be done. Um, and I think that there are ways that we can improve that, again, by, by having these kinds of platforms, these networks who are able to connect people to, to, to work that they know is happening on the ground. That's really important. Um, I, I think that that's one way of doing it. Uh, the, I mean, for example, this local wild NGO has been struggling for years to actually get some seed funding to really actually bring um, these kinds of innovations together. And it's been largely working actually with academia to do the kinds of work around the, um, the, the propagation and trials and analysis, um, the sort of nutritional analysis for some of the foods that they want to bring into the market. Um, so, so it is difficult uh, and I'm not the finance expert, so I'll sort of hand over to, to Ava at this point. Um, but, but I think it is important to rethink the kinds of financial instruments that, um, that we need in this sector. Um, and also to, to break a little bit of this reliance on sort of foreign direct investment around growth, right? That actually, I think in, in many African countries, we actually have um, capacity to look at um, sort of 
investing locally, right? And not just relying on, 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 um, on, on outside parties, because I think, again, that's not necessarily the most resilient strategy. So to also be a little bit um, more savvy around what we can do ourselves uh, and how we can enable the conditions for, for these kinds of innovations really to be able to, to have the effect that they, um, that they could. Right, so REAP is um, intrinsically driven by dual mission around um, reduction of poverty and um, climate action. So this, the combined effort around those two elements drive everything that, that we do. Um, we um, track a number of KPIs on our site around social and environmental uh, impacts, um, including GHG emissions and electricity generation, but also impacts around job creation, uh, impacts on uh, women um, and um, vulnerable populations as well. So that's, that's on the uh, side of, of um, you know, our social and environmental benefits important for our work. When it comes to um, consumer financing, we are not specialists in consumer financing. We specialize in financing small and medium enterprises, but we like to partner with small and medium enterprises that have a solution to consumer financing. So we have had some really good successes with fintech companies that provided um, energy uh, technologies or services to people. Um, and then like Simu Solar that has got uh, consumer financing as part of the package that they offer to their, to their clients. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up now. We're already running over because we started a bit late. Um, we've heard some really interesting points today. Um, we've heard about the, the value of, of data, technical innovation, making sure that we understand where the need is and the technical solutions are actually appropriate for the need. Um, we've also heard about um, the importance of innovative finance that kind of de-risks the propositions not only for the farmer themselves but for the the financial organizations and we've of course talked about just now the importance of social return on investment um, and uh, we heard from Sean who unfortunately had to, to leave a little bit early about the the importance of, of systems thinking beyond small partnerships helping us to reach scale, although of course we have to know what we actually mean by systems thinking, not just use it uh, as a buzzword, which I'm sure Sean wasn't doing. Um, and along with that, we should value kind of deep innovation, scarcity-led innovation, learn from people on the ground living with the challenges of adaptation and mitigation. Um, and uh, value their input um, as well as their kind of local crops, traditional ways of eating and um, learning as much as we can from indigenous cultures at the same time. Thank you all very much for your input today. It's been a really interesting session. Thank you.